when I was in uh, seminary, I had a part-time job cleaning pools, uh, which is something you can do in Texas year-round. There are lots of pools in Dallas. And uh, as you might imagine, uh, cleaning pools is not a job that requires uh, nice attire. My standard pool cleaning outfit during the summer would have been shorts that were bleach stained, uh, a ratty t-shirt, uh, usually the bandana on the head because that was cool back then, um, and my like really nasty canvas shoes. That was my normal pool cleaning attire. In the winter, I would trade that for something a little bit warmer, but still nothing really impressive to look at. Now, this was also a time at Dallas Seminary, we had a, a pretty strict dress code. You had to wear a suit and tie to class, or at least a coat and tie to class. And so on alternate days, I would be in my pool cleaning attire or my seminary outfit. Now, as I was driving through the neighborhoods I was in, there would be times that I would stop at the same fast food restaurants for a quick bite to eat. And I quickly noticed that there was a difference in the way I was treated in the same place, sometimes by the same people, depending on whether I was dressed for pool cleaning or dressed for class. If I'm dressed for class, it's like, oh, sir, nice to see you. How can I help you? And then when I'm dressed for pool cleaning, it's like, what do you want? <laughs> and I quickly noticed that there was that distinct difference just based on what I was wearing. In a world where so much is focused and placed on our differences, it's sadly not surprising to hear about people being treated differently because of their economic status or their skin color, or their hair color, or their clothing, or the language they speak, or some other characteristic. People have biases. People have prejudices. Even if we know it's wrong and we know it's something that we don't want to do, it can still be something that we struggle with. Favoritism, or partiality, or this treating of people differently because of some uh, exterior factors can take a lot of different forms. A person or a group of people receives preferential treatment over someone else. Someone else might be denied something or treated badly because they belong to a different group. Well, as we continue in the book of James this morning, we're going to identify the problem of partiality, of favoritism, why it's important for us to avoid this how do we identify it? How do we deal with it? Let's pray. Father, again, we come to your word and we ask for you to speak into our lives through the truth of your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit to convict us when we, where we need to be convicted, to encourage us where we need encouraging, to remind us of the truths of who you have called us to be as your people. And Father, again, just pray that you would speak into our lives, that we would have a desire to leave here and honor you in the way that we live. We ask in Jesus' name. So again, in the book of James, as we continue into this book, James was a leader uh, in the early church, in the early Christian church. I'm going to make sure my clicker works here. We have a new one. There we go. Uh, so James was an early leader in the Christian church, and... Uh, was the younger brother of Jesus. We kind of talked about that. And he is writing this letter that you can find near the back of your Bible, near the back of the Old T New Testament. We're in James chapter 2 uh, is where we're going to be picking up. But James, as a leader in the early church, is writing to believers. And he's writing to believers that are undergoing some, some persecution and some challenges. He talks about how they have been scattered. And so these are Jewish believers that have been scattered that are dealing with challenges of the early church. And so he is writing to give them a lot of instruction on how to live out their faith. So picking up in James chapter 2, verse 1, we're going to start off. It says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So he is again talking towards believers when he says, My brothers, this is kind of the collective brothers and sisters that he is addressing here. And he says, show no partiality. There is a very clear command that is given here. It is a very clear, straightforward command. Show no partiality. No favoritism. 
And this idea of partiality or favoritism, this is favoring one person over another. Excessive respect or honor being shown to one person and not to another. And he's saying, have none of this. And again, it's a very simple, clear, strong command. Let there be no partiality among you as believers in Christ. So he gives this command, and then he's going to give a reason for this command. He says, as believers in Jesus Christ, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus, as you live out your faith, as you show your faith, as you possess your faith in Jesus, as representatives of him, that's not how we are to act towards others. And he defines Jesus, describes Jesus. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If you were to show anyone partiality, it's going to be him. It is him, the Lord of glory. And to mistreat people who are his creation goes against who he is and how Jesus lived. And so he gives this command, he gives a reason, and he's going to give us an example. And an example of what this means. You know, James, what do you mean by showing partiality? How is this something that we do? And I don't think James would identify this specific situation if it wasn't something that was happening in their gatherings. This is something that he had either seen happening or had heard about happening in their gatherings. So in verse 2, he goes on, he says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and say, you, sit here in a good place. While you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So this scenario that he's painting, someone apparently wealthy comes into their gathering, and they're being show, showy with their, their fine clothing and their jewelry, and they get a place of honor. They get shown extra attention. And then someone in shabby clothing comes in. And they don't get the same respect, the same honor. In fact, they are treated with less honor. It's like, oh, the person that's wealthy, come sit here in this place of honor. And the other person, you can go stand over there. Or sit down here on the floor. Don't get your dirty selves on our nice seats. And they are treated with disrespect. Just because of their economic situation. Because of what they are wearing. Now, James is just identifying one example here of favoritism, and he's going to give a lot more explanation to this specific example, but this kind of difference, this kind of difference in treatment can happen for all kinds of reasons. This isn't the only way that people can be shown favoritism or partiality or prejudice could be shown. It could be a difference in the type of clothing. I have a friend who visited a church one time, and she wore pants when she visited this church. And she was told by somebody at this church, don't come back unless you're wearing a long skirt or dress. Well, guess what? She didn't go back. <laughs> it could be a disability or skin color or age or something else that makes someone show partiality to someone or someone else. Could be tattoos or piercings. At our old church, we had a couple that we were good friends with. And that was kind of their look. They had multiple tattoos. He had the nose ring. And they drove a long way to come to our church. And one time I asked her about that. And she said, this was the first church that we came to that we did not feel judged and condemned just for walking in the door and how we looked. Could be something about the way someone acts. Uh, I know somebody that frequently works as a greeter at a large church. And they had an experience as a greeter one time. Somebody came in uh, to their church, and it was somebody that was dressed kind of quirky. And this greeter could tell that this person was just kind of an unusual personality. Uh, but this person asked about where to go for a Sunday school class. And the greeter said, well, you'd probably enjoy this class, and sent them to this, this option for a Sunday school class. Later that day, somebody from that class came and said to this greeter, did you send this person to our class? Yeah, I did. Don't ever send somebody like that to our class again. They did not fit in. They are not our kind of people. This was in a church. Sadly, this shows up 
in ways that it should not. Partiality can show up in a lot of forms. So how does James describe it? He goes on with more detail here. He talks about making distinctions among yourselves. Now that doesn't mean that you ignore differences, that you pretend like differences don't exist. Our differences, our uniqueness, whether it's racial background, heritage, skills, talents, abilities, our personal preferences about things, that's what, what adds to the diversity and the strength of the body of Christ. But when those differences become a distinction for how we treat one another, that's the problem. And James says it makes you judges with evil thoughts. He doesn't hold back on this in identifying this sin. Any standard of judging, of distinction that makes you feel superior to someone else, those are evil thoughts. You know, you can also, you can show partiality to the poor over the rich just as easily. Say, ah, oh, those rich people, they just think they're better than everybody else. I don't want to have anything to do with that. You can show the same kind of partiality or prejudice the other way just as easily. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. That's not how we are to see people. Any attitude that makes one group inferior or superior to another group based on human distinctions is wrong. Now consider the story in 1 Samuel. Uh, the prophet Samuel is assigned by God to go pick the next king for Israel. And Samuel is, is called and goes to the uh, this, uh, family of a man named Jesse. And Jesse has many sons. And God has revealed to Samuel that one of these sons is going to be the king. And so he starts looking them over. And he comes across one man named Eliab, one of Jesse's sons. And Eliab looks impressive. He looks like the kind of guy that you would make king. But here's the message that Samuel gets from the Lord in that circumstance. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And it would be revealed to Samuel to select David, the youngest, the least impressive looking of the bunch, as the next king. But God sees from a different perspective than us. He knows the heart. Now, James is going to go on and talk a little bit more about this example, picking up in verse 5. He says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And so James is going to give more of an explanation of this example that he is giving and talk a little bit more about this favoritism of the, the rich over the poor and deal with that issue. But I want you to hear again as we think about the poor. He describes the poor and talks about them as being rich in faith, being heirs of the kingdom. And again, consider the words of Jesus, this time from the Gospel of Luke. Blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God belongs to you. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Again, in the words of Jesus, blessed are the poor, those who hunger the perspective we need to have on the poor and the rich is different from God's perspective. And when he goes on, when Jesus talks about the rich, there are circumstances in the Gospels where Jesus describes how wealth can keep people from God. There's the story of the rich young man that comes to Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 19, and is asking Jesus about how to be saved. And Jesus reveals to this young man that, that his wealth, is the obstacle that is keeping him from faith in God. And in that, after that story in Matthew chapter 19, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God 
all things are possible. You know, it can be more difficult for the wealthy, for the prosperous, to be aware of their spiritual needs because so many of their physical needs are so easily met that that's their focus is on the physical material things that they have. Uh, in the years of doing student ministry, I've, I've had a lot of different friends uh, that did student ministry in some really wealthy neighborhoods and some really wealthy parts of town. And I heard from multiple youth leaders that worked in those scenarios how difficult it was working with some of those kids because they had no awareness of their spiritual needs because they were so focused on all the physical stuff that they had around them all the time. But thankfully, we have this promise from Jesus that with God, all things are possible. That apart from the work of God, no one's going to be saved, no matter their wealth or lack of wealth or achievements. But James here in this situation is describing the rich, and he talks about them as oppressors, people that are dragging people into court, that are speaking out against Jesus or speaking out against God. Because clearly there were some situations going on where the early Christians were experiencing great mistreatment at the hands of people that were wealthy, that were in positions of power and influence. And James is challenging them here. Why would you show this group favoritism when they're not doing anything to deserve it? Unless you're just looking out for your own interests, what you might be able to get out of them, just for your own selfish gain, or maybe what they can do for you. You know, there's this temptation, even within the body of Christ today, to, to glorify the celebrity Christian. And, like, ooh, we heard this big celebrity went to church. Maybe they're becoming a believer. Like, that person represents any more value than someone else being a believer. Yes, it's great if that person's going to become a believer. But we don't need to glorify some celebrity because of their interest in the gospel. So it's important also within this explanation, though, to see that he doesn't say, treat the rich person badly. He doesn't say, shame them because of their wealth. Make them feel bad because of their wealth. He doesn't say that either. Show no favoritism to one or the other. Now, James isn't finished yet. Verse 8 says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So within this paragraph, James is really dealing with love and mercy. Talking about the love and mercy that we receive from God. And he makes it really clear that partiality is not love. We are to love people for themselves, not because of what we might get from them, not because of what they might do for you, not because they're a lot like you or because they're like what you want to be like. We are to love people because we are called to love people. And he calls this the, the royal law. You know, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Uh, Jesus said the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the standard for how we are to treat others. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. Showing partiality, showing favoritism towards someone over someone else is not love. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. So how do you see people? When you encounter people with differences from you, how do you see them? How do you look at them? I've got a short video illustration that's going to kind of challenge you again with that thinking. Right. 
right. Okay. <laughs> simple illustration how every person that we meet is made in the image of God. Whatever their background, perspective, history, tradition, every person we meet is made in the image of God. And in case we don't quite get it yet, James is really, really clear. He says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin. Partiality is sin. It's not a mistake. It's not a preference. You know, it's not, well, I just like people like this more. To treat one person differently from someone else because of some standard that's important to you is sin. It turns us from God. Now, again, in case you don't quite get this yet, I've got a few different passages from other parts of Scripture that address this. Deuteronomy 16, 19. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe. Proverbs 28, 21. To show partiality is not good. In Acts, when Peter is starting to understand that the message of the gospel is not just for the Jew, but also for the Gentile, for everyone, it says, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. In Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, Paul writes, God shows no partiality. And when Paul is wrapping up his instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy, he writes this, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do you get the picture that this is something God takes seriously, that is important to him? And then the next part of this passage in James just points out that we are all lawbreakers. We are all lawbreakers. It says if we fall at one point of the law, we're guilty of breaking God's law. You can't pick which parts that you want to follow. If you break one of them, you are a lawbreaker. We are all lawbreakers, transgressors, sinners. Pick any of those words. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us hold to that standard. And because of that, we need mercy. We need mercy. And mercy carries with it the idea of compassion. Uh, mercy is withholding judgment from someone due to compassion or kindness because of the situation that they are in. Mercy is relieving someone of their suffering. Mercy also releases someone from getting what they have deserved for something that they've done wrong. We see mercy and grace a lot of times together in the Bible. There is a distinction between the two. Grace is getting something extra that you don't deserve. Mercy is being rescued from suffering or consequences that you sometimes do deserve. Again, it is receiving compassion and kindness from someone. So we need mercy. We are called to be merciful to others, not to be judgmental, not to condemn others. 
Now there's a question. How do you balance the, the biblical idea of accountability with the, the call to holiness that we even see here in the book of James? James is calling us to a high standard of holiness. So how do you balance that lack of, of casting judgment upon others with this call to holiness? You know, if you call out sin in someone else's life, point out someone is living in a sinful way, a lot of times people, even people who don't know the Bible, love to bring up these words of Jesus, judge not that you be not judged. People always love to bring up that passage. Well, let's put that within the context. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus speaking. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So the full context of what Jesus was saying here is the way you judge is the way you will be judged. There are times for us to judge others or to point out sin, to call others to holiness, but it is a compassionate judgment. It's a merciful judgment. It's a judgment, a pointing out of sin that comes from a place of humility with the goal of restoration. Coming alongside someone in their mess and saying, guess what? I'm messed up too. Let's figure out how to get this together. Let's figure out how to walk through this together. Let's figure out how to deal with these things in the right way. Now, I read a story this week about a, a mom who was dealing with uh, a fight and an argument that had broken out uh, between two of her kids. I hear that happens in families sometimes. Um, but So this mom is dealing with this argument, this fight that has happened between her kids, and she separates them and has a separate conversation with each one of them, finds out kind of what had gone on, and quickly sees, as is usually the case, that there has been sin on the part of both of these siblings. And so as she's talking to them, again, separately, she asks each one, okay, what, what should be the consequence for your sibling? And after each of these siblings has pronounced their sentence, has pronounced their judgment on their sibling for whatever they had done, the mom said, well, okay, that's going to be your consequence. Well, suddenly the judgment, the sentence that seemed really fair and appropriate was suddenly unfair. That is judgment without mercy. That is condemnation without consideration for someone else. Judgment without mercy says, I've got it together and I'm better than you. James says to have mercy. He says mercy triumphs over judgment. Don't we all want that to be true in our lives? To receive mercy over judgment? The book of Lamentations, describing God, it says his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Our mercy needs to be the same. Towards one another, towards ourselves as well, trusting in God's grace, resting on His mercy. So I've got a question. On this, Imagine this is a scale. Judgmentalism on one side, mercy on the other side. Where would you tend to put yourself if you put an X on that line somewhere in your attitude towards the people that you encounter, towards the interactions that you have with people during the course of a week? Just as you walk around town and have interactions with people or just see people, do you tend more towards the judgmentalism side or towards the mercy side? James says, show mercy to others over judgment. Do not show partiality. So where is judgmentalism most likely to show up in your life? Or in what area is partiality a problem for you? Commit to seeing and treating everyone as created in God's image. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all lawbreakers 
who need the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness that are offered through Jesus' death on the cross. I'd encourage you this morning, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you need his grace and mercy. Accept that gift today. And you know what? In one sermon, I can't solve all the issues of racism, classism, any other kind of division in our country, and neither can you. But the way this works itself out is Jesus wants to change our hearts and change our lives so that as followers of Christ, we bring that change everywhere we go, every relationship that we have, every interaction we have with others is our opportunity as believers in Christ to show no favoritism, to show no partiality, to treat everyone with the grace, the dignity, the mercy that they deserve. As believers in Christ, as we hold to that faith, don't show partiality, don't show favoritism, bring mercy and grace everywhere you go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that you are a God that does not show partiality, that your grace and your mercy are freely available to anyone who would put their faith and their trust in you. And Father, I do pray that if there is anyone here this morning that has never put their trust in you for the forgiveness of their sins, that they would do that this morning, believing in Jesus, that he did go to the cross for our sins, pay the penalty for our sins so that we could receive the gracious gift of eternal life. Father, I pray that you would continue to use your word and by your Holy Spirit would continue to challenge us and convict us to change in the areas where we tend to show partiality or favoritism to others. May we also be people that show your mercy and give grace, and that we would live in a way that honors your love for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.